Well, every so often this um, this silly venture, whatever this venture is, he goes, uh, finds itself in situations where there's a very funny and frankly frightening mismatch. <laughs> Um, and rightly or wrongly, everyone in this room today comes from a cricketing background where you tend to hang out with, play with, speak with, and associate with people who are at your level. Yeah. Um, not today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing things down, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Got some clubby. <laughs> today, <laughs> today we're in the presence of greatness. Um, and it's greatness that, as everyone attests, has never put himself above anybody else, which is strange, and we're going to ask about that. Right. Um, it's greatness that fringe players and grade cricketers and fringe grade cricketers unanimously say always showed care, respect, and attention to them. Again, which we're going to ask about. Um, the man we're talking about today enjoys that reputation despite having amassed 27,000 international runs from 543 matches. Jesus Christ. Uh, in tests, he hit those runs at 52, rounding up a bit there. <laughs> in ODIs, it was at 42. First class cricketer was at 56. There was 356 international catches. He's the winning most test captain in Australian test history. He's also won three World Cups, two as captain. I think the country knows all of these things, uh, but it still makes us very safe to read that out. Yeah. Okay. That um, can't believe those four, the, the forearms are actually in this room. Anyway, Unbelievable. Um, he's now a coach <laughs> and a commentator <laughs> par excellence. This will finish in a sec. Um, <laughs> he's the best since Bradman. Uh, nobody's looked better in a baggy green, in my view. Yeah. Uh, he's with us for an hour. And he's just learnt that. And uh, and so let's <laughs> commence by saying it's the deepest of pleasures to welcome RT Ponting to TJC Towers. Ricky, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. You can keep going if you want. If there's anything else that you can talk about and bring up from my career, then go for it. But I think you've, you probably crossed uh, most things off there. But uh, nice to be here. Always fun catching up with you, boys. That's good. That's a relief. Um Ricky, uh, w w you know, when you look around this decadent studio, just to kick things off here, um, and you ask yourself, why am I here? Uh, did, did, you have, did you ever in your wildest dreams from being a Mowbray boy, you know, playing club cricket at Mowbray in the early 90s, let's say, did you ever think that, you know, grade cricket would be the basis of a media entertainment product in the 21st <laughs> century? <laughs> it probably should be. It, it probably should have always been, to be honest. I mean, it's anyone that's played Great cricket, club cricket, realises how big and important it is in the scheme of the world game. So, And I don't think enough attention has probably ever been paid to club cricket, to be honest. I mean, even, you know, the modern players are probably not playing as much as, as once before, which I think is a bit of a shame because I think if you can, the more, even the back end of my career when I did play a bit more great cricket, just to be around your local club and see what impact, you know, even a state player or an Australia player can have on a, on a great club is pretty amazing. So um, that's one thing that's probably died off a lot, which is disappointing. But um, I think that, you know, if the players actually do have a chance to sit back and take five minutes to have a think about where it all began and how it started for them and if they can give a little bit back to their clubs, and I think um, everyone's better for it. Who's got the most social cachet in Launceston at the moment, you or Ariane Titmus? <laughs> I think she's one truly really got me covered. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> got a, wall, a wardrobe full of gold medals and yeah. I haven't spent much time there in the last 20 years. So she's, <laughs> okay. I think she's close. Really yeah, I think she's voluntarily really got me covered. Uh, have you done any like mentoring with the? I actually I, played. I, I actually played grade cricket against her dad. Really, really? Steve Steve Tipmus, Yeah, who was a he was a local um, news presenter. Actually, worked for one of the oh, TV right. stations down there, and I played grade cricket against him. So there you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, uh, any recollection of how that no, game I, went? I didn't remember it. I got told about it after she won all the gold medals. <laughs> I, I've been reminded of the fact that I played some grade cricket against him. But I I do I do remember him because he was, as I said, a, a news presenter that. Um, that I knew quite well and I caught up with, but I didn't remember the uh, the on field battles. Hey, that we had I'm, I'm glad to. Game, yeah. I remember learning that he was a news presenter because yeah. they interviewed him after Ariane won gold, and I was yeah. like, "This bloke can yeah. speak." Yeah. You know what I mean? He's an actor. That's right. Yeah. He's got his lines ready. Yeah. But yeah anyway, yeah. I thought you were going to say, "Yeah, I made 120 or something." But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Scratchy early, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably sl he probably sledged me good, like most. <laughs> great cricketers in Tasman are starting off as a sort of a nine year old faced yeah, <laughs> yeah, 12 yeah, or 13 yeah. year old I copped a little bit early doors yeah <laughs> who's this 12 year old yeah, yeah. oh he's good yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Rick um, doing some research for today and uh, as, as we do we, we ask around anonymously people have, uh, like, provide anonymous sources um, so I hope you can confirm this, but I started inquiring about whether you'd be quarantining ahead of the, the GABA test we, we're recording this he goes on uh, early November um, sure. so I was told that there would be zero chance of you quarantining ahead of the Gabba, um, because you've just been in so many bubbles, right? And also Channel 7 isn't doing it either. But, um, I, I was also told after a recent stint in Sydney, 
a maid commentator, uh, commented that there was an unusual number of wine bottles around the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. po- po- ponting wines, <laughs> that is. Uh, and I can only guess a lot of uh, digital wine tasting events were being held. Uh, is that, and is that how you made your way through bubbles? That's um, that was what I said was happening. That we were doing a lot of uh, wine t- Zoom wine tasting sessions. But yeah. no, to be totally honest, uh, we did do a lot of that. I was in quarantine in Sydney for obviously for those two weeks, and with this wine business sort of uh, growing by the day, and we're doing whatever we can to sort of get the name and the brand out there a little bit more. So um, one of my business business partners, David Krenich, had organised quite a few of those um, Zoom meetings to have with the, with our winemaker in South Australia as well, but. So he'd organised to have three cases of wine sent up to the room. You know, one Sauvignon Blanc mm. and one yeah. Pinot. And one mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we've got it. We'll, look, we've got them here. Well, got we actually d- discussed off air whether we'd um, we crack we'd, it. whether we would crack it, except that it's nine a.m. and um, and you never too early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've already had two beers, so it's just yeah. <laughs> a change of palate. Yeah, the not, palate not ready stuff. Yet. Yeah, yeah. palate stuff. <laughs> yeah, and I laid out. So you, yeah, your research is right. So I had made my way through um, in those fourteen days. I'd made my way through most of those um, <laughs> bottles of wine, and yeah. then I'd checked out in the morning. Um, I'd got in the car. To go to the airport, um, David Krenich's business partner had to go back to the hotel and actually collect some signed bottles I'd left there. And when he got there, the maid had said to him, it looks like he's had some sort of party up in there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in quarantine by myself. <laughs> and, she, and the comment was, it looks like he's had a big party in his mm. room. So no, I, had, I did have a couple of glasses a night to get myself through. Because trust yeah. me, if you, got, if you haven't done it, no. 14 days... In the one hotel room is uh, is pretty hard work. So, I bet. Yeah. No good. just a couple of glasses a night, just to get me off to sleep, and mm. that was about it. Mm. Obviously, we're heading into the ashes. That's the thing that's going to happen this year. Um, I think every question that I could think of about your playing career, like things that you've achieved playing against England, you've probably been asked a hundred times. Wickets, runs. You got Michael Vaughan at that time. Old Trafford, series victories, catches. You've done it all. I wonder if like there's something that sticks in your mind when you think about an Ashes series, which uh, which didn't involve you directly playing. So like, but you obviously your career spanned in the Ashes. How many Ashes did you play in? Ten. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. a lot of them. What a great career. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it must be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like we're talking about Tendulkar. Yeah. His career goes for like yeah. fifteen different decades. Eighty nine. Oh. 200 yeah. test matches. 200 <laughs> test matches. That's too many. Because I thought I'd played a lot. And he's mm. played an extra two years on top of me, basically. An extra, yeah. No, more. Yeah, extra 30-odd tests. Yeah. yeah. Would you play 160? 168. 168. So, yeah. 32 tests more. Yeah, probably anyway. another two and a half years of test cricket on top of what I did. So. He was good. Um, anyway, I wonder if there's something that you think about in your playing days that didn't involve you directly. I'm, think, I'm thinking like Steve Waugh's SCG 100 in 2003 or McGrath rolling his ankle or NASA batting first. In uh, 2003, yeah, is me, it, is me it batting first in 2005? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, bowling first. Bowling first, bowling yeah. First. Is there something that, like, you know, you, you sort of think about, which didn't involve you directly, but as a memory of the Ashes generally? Oh, look, there are a lot. I, I, I think about Mark War's first hundred. Oh, it was yeah, an Ashes yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. at that ninety-one. Yeah, at the Adelaide Oval, I reckon it was. Um, mm. My uncle actually played uh, an Ashes, a couple of Ashes, te- one Ashes Test match. Greg Campbell in '89, actually. Really? So yeah, it's my mum's brother. So yeah. that's a, that's a memory that that I have that was pretty special. Cause just just to think that someone in my family could actually do it made my dream, I guess, a little bit not a reality, but something that I thought I could probably achieve if yeah. someone in my family could do it. Then there's no mm. reason I couldn't. Um, I mean, not yeah, in other game. Mark Taylor's hundred at Edgebaston in. 97. 97, which was a bit of a comeback sort of moment for him yeah. as well. Oh, he we, could not get one off the square for like three for long, years. Yeah, for a long time. So <laughs> I remember that. To be around that team and then all of us understanding how much pressure he was under and he was the captain at the time and how important it was for him and the team and the series. And he got that 100. Um, I reckon Bluey might have got 100 with him actually in the same game, who was a, a great mate of mine. So, yeah. um, I mean, Ash's memories wind the clock back as far as you like. I mean, I, I'm... Yeah. You know, I'm 46 now, so I sort of started watching. The, the earliest memories I've got are probably in the early 80s of Ashes cricket. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one thing that sort of stands out was was AB and Jeff Thompson nearly getting Australia across the line. I think that was here, wasn't it? MCG, mm-hmm. um, when Tomo nicked that one to, to slip. Oh, yeah. Um, so all those sort of memories are, uh, of Ashes cricket are, you know, I must admit I don't sit back and think a lot about what's happened in, in my career, but when you think about... Mm. about Ashes cricket. And I've always said, you know, the Ashes battles for me is the, the pinnacle of our game. And um, the things that I miss the most now being able to, you know, I just wish I could play one more Ashes test. That's how, sort of how special it is to 
to me and to all Australians and and to all young Englishmen as well that mm. grow up, you know, wanting to play the game. It's all about Ashes cricket. So, mm. I mean, the other things that go with Ashes cricket that's not necessarily about Test matches is just the time you spend on on the bus. You know, on, on the team bus mm. in the yeah. UK, you're there for yeah. four months. You know, you got another twenty odd boys and girls around you for that period of time and you travel to the counties and you play little county grounds yeah. and you see all the old members there. Like, it's, it, it's re- it is really special. I mean, they're, they're the things you miss at the end of it. Mm. So, Ponting's about five this summer. I That's know, interesting. I'm starting to get yeah. tingles just <laughs> wants to play again. Yeah. Um, Ricky, uh, how, how are you seeing these ashes? So, you know, the accepted wisdom is that Australia is short-priced favourites. Uh, our bowling's too good for their batting. You know, their bowling will struggle to get 20 wickets. Uh, and yet we've not played for a year and when we last played we lost um and we got we're pretty outplayed as well uh i know everyone can carry hope but so what, what sort of hope for our english audience would you give england of being a serious threat uh and causing a, or boil over or taking the series deep this summer yeah i did a, some stuff for channel seven last week and i said england can win but they won't yeah, you know, yeah, they, bad, they, yeah. they can yeah. but they uh, they yeah. and i think a lot of the things you brought up there are spot on um you know their batting does look frail. They, you know, technically a lot of their batsmen look um, nicky nicky, different. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Rory Burns and uh, oh yeah, yeah, and those yeah. sort of guys yeah. look a bit different. But I mean, it, with with Stokes being in that side now, it's a completely different looking team. I think. I mean, we saw what he did against us last time over there. He he can single handedly win games. Mm. Um, yes, I think Australia will win and win well, but I've just still got this little doubt in the back of my mind about last summer. And because we said exactly the same thing last summer, didn't yeah. we? There's no, you know, our bowlers in against Indian batsmen in Australia will mm. knock them over and, and then Best their ever. bowlers won't be good enough mm. to, to get our batters out. Well, that wasn't the way it worked last, last year. And it, it just goes to show with the, the grit and determination that they showed, if England can do something like that. And if their, if their technical frailties can be, I guess, worked Worked out and worked over by their mental side of their their game, then they're they're a chance to win. And I mean, we've we've still got a few gaps in our side that we've got to fill as well. You know, who's going to open? Who's going to bat at five or six? So there's a couple of gaps there that we need to fill and sort out. But yeah, Australia will start short price favourites. They'll they'll win in Brisbane, um, and see where they go from there. Mm, five nil. Yeah, I hear mm, you. Yeah. Um, I'm not so sure about five. <laughs> and Australia never lose in Brisbane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who was uh? Who was, who was the first beer you went to in the England dressing room after an Ashes series? Who, who, who were the good blokes in England? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you put me on the spot there. Uh, <laughs> um, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Uh, KP. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, actually, to be honest, I, actually get, I do get on well with KP. Yep. Um, Freddie was always yep. he was always sitting quite close to an esky at the end of a, of a test match. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, look, we. It's pretty fair to say that there wasn't much chat amongst teams until that last ball, or the last test yeah, match had, yeah, been, yeah. had been played. But, yeah. um, geez, who, who would I have gone to? Probably some of the, the younger guys that, that I probably was wanting to sort of get to know a little bit better. Like I would play a lot against Strauss and Vaughan and yep. Flintoff and Anderson and, and Broad and those guys. So I played a lot against them and knew them quite well. But um, yeah, I, 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 I must admit, I wasn't rushing. To anyone's yeah. side, yeah, I can see the competitive time. flint in the eye. It's just kind <laughs> yeah. of, uh, yeah, it works. I think it works both ways. And the other, mm. the other side of that, I guess, is that I, I didn't have a chance to play much canter cricket either, so I didn't know a lot of oh, the yeah. players. A lot of the, the other guys that had played a fair, fair bit of canter cricket knew the, the England, England guys probably better than me, and they they would be pretty happy to go and sit down and have a beer with them. But no, that competitive uh, edge for me was still still always there. Yeah, I just want to bring you back to some of the the doubt you were talking about with the Aussie side. Um, I. I don't know if you would agree with this, but there's probably understood to be sort of five or so world-class players in the Aussie side or guys that will go down in history. You know, two or three might be greats. Yet they're, they're ranked fourth in the world in, in test cricket. Uh, like has, has this generation of Australian men's, of the Australian men's team underperformed? Uh, and if so, why do you think that's the case? Or if they haven't, do we just overrate the players? Um. I don't know if we overrate the players because there's you know world rankings and things like that that probably determine mm. how we even look at the mm. players. You know, so was you know Smith and Marnus and and Davy. You know, mm. Those they're, they're the three sort of standout mm. batters, aren't they? Um, and you, then you look at Cummins and Hazelwood and Lyon. If mm. you look at the world rankings, those guys have been in the top ten probably for certainly the last five or six years yeah. of their careers. Anyway, you so think six six players in a side at that level, you'd think well that's a pretty good basis of a side, right? Yeah, mm. it is. Yeah. Um, 
I think I just think like last summer, they've just been really critical moments. I reckon in the last four or five years, and even if if you wind the clock back to the last Ashes series, even though we retained the Ashes, there are a couple of moments there. Even that Headingley game that I talked about with Stokes that. Mm. You just can't understand and see how they didn't win those moments. Mm. Sydney last year against India, how did they not win that yeah. game? How did how did Brisbane end up like it did? You yeah. know, there's been some, you know, really glaring frailties. I reckon of a for a team to be out. If they nail those moments there, mm. then they're not ranked number four, and we're not. We wouldn't even be bringing up. You know, why with six great players haven't they been better? So it's why do we not ma- nail those moments? Do you think is that like what is it coincidence or is, is it? Is it a, is it leadership? Because because it, it, it does seem to be a little bit of a pattern. You can kind of you can arm wrestle your way to outplaying other teams for a good period of time, but when the time comes to strike, there there seems to be an issue there. What what it seems yeah. so invisible to the untrained eye. You're, you're the most trained eye alive. Yeah. <laughs> um, it seemed to me, and I'm, I've spent a little bit of time around the team the last three or four years at World Cups and whatever else. But it just, it when. Certainly the test team anyway, when they've put, been put under the most extreme pressure, they haven't been able to get it done. Like with, even with Stokes in that one innings at Headingley and, yeah. you know, Ashwin and, and um, Vahari sort of mm. putting up the, the brick wall in Sydney last year, when the pressure's really come on, they haven't just been able to just make that one breakthrough or get that one partnership going, That's um, which I think is the trademark of, of great teams. You know, and I think that... Thinking back to the, the really good teams that I played in, it was those critical moments that we just got right all the time. Someone yeah. would put their hand up and you say, well, okay, we're under the pump here, but I'm going to be the person that's going to change it. I'm going to get it done. And more often than not, you know, that we, we were able to turn mm. some pretty tricky situations in games into really positive ones. You know, whether it was Gilly coming in at six and getting 100 in, you know, 80 <laughs> balls or... Yeah. We just uh, need him. Or Hayden or Langer <laughs> yeah. at the top, you know, getting through a tough spell against some good quality fast bowling, whatever it was... It, it, it just happened that way, and it hasn't happened that way with this this current team. I, maybe, yeah, maybe, I don't think it's I don't think there's any relationship issues. Mm. I, th- I think it's just the the trust that comes with a with a, a really tight quality group that have been together for a long time. And and you know, even I mean, I think Payne and, and Justin have done a, an amazing job. What what they've been able to do to transform the team the perception of the team anyway, from what the public now see and think and look at the Australian cricket team and what they did. Soon after Cape Town, I think they've done an amazing job there, and their on-field performances have been good without being great. And I and I think at the end of this summer, they've got a chance to to make those on-field performances great. I mean, mm-hmm. and you know, teams' reputations and individuals' reputations are made on Ashes cricket. Simple as that. So if this team mm. um, can win an Ashes series at home, all of a sudden last year against in- India will be forgotten about, and um, yeah, they can start striving to be the, the best and number one ranked test team mm. in the world. So. Ricky, um, I suppose we're talking as though they can rectify mistakes and that there might be, there's, there might be bright skies ahead for, for the Australian cricket team off the back of what's come before. But I, I, uh, I mean, I look at the Australian side and partic- I want to ask you about batting because you mentioned there before, you've got Smith and Warner. That, uh, Smith averages 60, minus average 60, Warner averages 48. Um, it's a bit pretty bare after that. Uh, Warner's 35. Smith's thirty two, so he's probably he's, he's got a little bit of time left. Uh, but does it drop off a cliff after that a little bit? Do you have any concerns about the future of Australian batting? I mean, we, we don't seem to have any kind of any guys coming through that are established, maybe in their late twenties, who can pick it up. If got if, if um, the guys start getting a little bit old or, or whatever, uh, I compare that to say you know the Indian, which is what we do now. But you know the Indian um, pathways and guys coming through there. Uh, I, I, who are you seeing that might pick up the baton for Australian batting? We are lots on Will Bukowski, but he's got question marks. Mm. What, what, where's next? Is our, are, are our systems bringing through enough bats? Do you have any concerns? Um, I, well, the first thing we shouldn't ever do, I don't think, is compare us to India because once you've spent some time there and you see how many players they have. <laughs> I mean, they've got 46 or 47 first-class teams. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the yeah. whole country loves the game. Any young kid you see in the street is playing cricket. And so they, they are going to have a lot of depth. And the IPL is certainly helping that because they've got you know, a lot of these younger players now, they're in IPL setups. They're around the best players in in their country. They're around the best players in the world. A lot of them have got the best coaches in the world are helping them out at a young age. Uh, they're being exposed to high-level cricket at a young age. So when, like last summer, when a lot of those guys that we hadn't heard of actually get put up into a test match, they're not scared of it. They, they've been around these yeah. teams. They've been around these good players. They understand the moment and they embrace it and take it on. That's what you know really impressed me so much about them last year. Our, are our pathways 
right? Yeah, I think they're right because they've they've only gotten better over the last fifty years. And so there's no reason why mm. we can't keep producing. But um, you know, are we? We're not. Seeing, we haven't for the last probably ten years. And well, Michael Clark or Steve Smith probably the last ones that have sort of come in at a really young age and been and looked at home at international level. Cam Green, I think, looked at home. Yeah. Last summer, I think he. I think he's a a player. Um, who are the next lot? I think there are guys like Josh Philippi, Josh Inglis. Um, you know, Travis. I, I think still. I still think Travis Head has got a test a test match future. I still think Kawaj is in our six top mm, best yeah. six batsmen in the country as well. And I've so said do, that. do you have him in the top six for the Ashes? I think he's been in our our best six batsmen from the mm. moment that he started playing for Australia. I, mm. I think he. I don't think he should have gone out of the team. Yeah, right. To mm. be honest, because I think the guys that they've brought in after that haven't looked anywhere near as accomplished at Test level as what Kawaja yeah, did. Um, and I know Kawaja's away record was nowhere near as good as his record at home. But um, if you have got someone that can average sixty or seventy in Australia, they'll they'll work it out eventually uh, in mm. in different parts of the world. So look, I wouldn't be surprised if they go back to him for the summer. Um, Nick Maddinson's obviously playing really well at the moment. Whoever the whoever's has got the hottest hand come selection for the first test will we'll probably mm. get that spot in the middle order. But um, there there is enough there is enough young talent there because we, we see that they a lot of the younger players really do dominate first class cricket. They've just struggled with the next step up mm. to international yep. cricket, mm. and I think a lot of that a lot of that comes with the added pressure. It also comes with the fact I don't think a lot of them have been given a really good extended run at it either. Like I, I think it's it gets to the point if we haven't got a lot of talent, just work out who the best two are and give them a good crack at it for a while. Mm. You're going to have your ups and downs, but if there's no one that's st- a standout better player, then mm. let's not keep mixing and matching and trying to find someone that's going to get it done. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. With the scheduling this summer, because England have had this problem now this year with 100 introduced, they now have to split the county championship the same way we have to split the Shield season. You play three games at the top or four mm. or whatever, then you have the big bash for most of the summer and then you finish the Sheffield Shield season. It's like, so Will Bukowski, for instance, if he wants to come in for the MCG, he won't have played a Shield game because he might be available by, by sort of mid-December, but he's playing for, I don't even know who he plays for in the Big Bash, one of them. So like, oh, he's, not, he's, he's with the Stars, but he's never played a game, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm. okay, too good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, no, it's like just ahead of yesterday, I want to thank you because I was just watching some old clips on, on Road Blender 2's channel of mm. you facing Glenn McGrath Uh Tasmania versus New South Wales. Yeah. He scored 126. Yeah. Oh my God! Some of the SCG. Oh, absolutely yeah. smashing into pigeon. Most of my mate yeah. pigeon. Yeah. That would have felt good. You send me that. look at that. The question is: McGrath overrated? Thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, he, no, he wasn't. No, mm. I don't think he was overrated. I think he was. He was pretty good. But no, that, that day he was wasn't. <laughs> well, that were the challenges you loved. No, he was really good that day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that were the challenges you loved. Because I'd, I'd been to the academy with him as well a couple of years before that, so I'd faced right. a lot of him there and. Even rocking up for a shield game and playing Warney in a shield game was, was always a lot of fun as well, but it didn't happen all that often. Mm. Yeah, how'd you go against Warney in a shield yeah. game? Yeah, smashed oh, I don't think he got me out. Just got to use your feet. Yeah, yeah. just get forward to him. You just got to read it out of the hand. You just got to read it out of the hand, yeah. Um, all right, it, it, could we pivot to the, you, you were mentioning Indian cricket and the IPL there as well. Um, the IPL, uh, the next season starts in about 16 weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So, first, there's the. Mega auction. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's two new teams. Uh, you're on record saying you're going to try and keep the Delhi family together. Um, Want to sort of uh, curveball you there? Um, you're going to try and keep the Delhi family together, but but surely you're also up for bidding <laughs> yeah. vis-a-vis new franchises. Uh, you would be an extremely appealing prospect for a number of them. But uh, so, how do you at once keep the Delhi family together? And then, if you know, whoever paid twenty billion dollars for <laughs> if you're luck coaching, now, if you're coaching luck now, or I'm yeah. not bad, just like, oh, what about the, what about us, Rick? <laughs> yeah, um, you have done your research, haven't you? Because I'm not contracted yet. <laughs> 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 I haven't signed the contract. No, look, I, I, in all honesty, I, I'm, I'm not. But I, I'm pretty sure I will be at Delhi next year. I've, I've loved the last four years that I've had there. We've, you know, we've gone from last first season I coached there, third, second, third. So we, we've We've had a great time and, and some of the young players I've had a chance to work with there have been exceptional and, and really good people and um, that's what I want to try and be able to do again. I want to be able to, you know, the Pritby Shaws and the Shreya mm. years and mm. Arvish Khans and these guys that we've had in that system for, you know, for three or four years that have really now turned into exceptionally good um, IPL players and some of them have turned into really good international players as well. So, 
And it's not even for me. It's not even so much about those big name players. Like if we, if I can keep a few of those guys there, great. But it's more of the the fringe players that we've had around that have just been that have added so much. A lot of them haven't played. A lot of them haven't played a game. But mm. when you see them in the team and at training and how hard they work and how much they enjoy it, that's the that, that's what I sort of want to be able to recreate again, if if possible. Now with the retention stuff, you know, we we can only keep four players, and we had I think twenty. Four or twenty-five in the squad last year, so mm. to try to try and bring the majority of those guys back would be will be ideal, but it's going to be a challenge as well because, it, you know, with the retentions, you know, with with the two new teams, you can guarantee that they're talking with oh, yeah, they're talking to Pant, that you know, they're trying mm. to secure these guys and lock them in as as you know, generational franchise players, if you like, and it's right. up to it's up to me and and the hierarchy at Delhi to make sure that they don't get their hands on them. So, mm. what's it uh, what's it like working with uh, Big Papi Stein, Marcus Steinus? I love the big fella. I love Stein. Mm. I think he probably hopefully he'd say the same thing about me as well. And we've um, I've known I've known him for a long time. I played I played a little bit of shoe cricket against him at the back end of my career. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever told him this, but the first game I ever saw him play uh, for W uh, for WA, I rang our state coach at the time and said, "Get this bloke down to." To Tassie, he looks like mm. a, he looks like a player really? to me. Yeah, I'm not sure if I've ever um, told Stoin that, mm. but um, yeah, like I, he's maybe before you go on, just because um, <laughs> we asked him what he thought about you a couple yeah. of weeks ago. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you sort of creep around here without I'll knocking just, the camera just, around? Oh, you can you can get yeah. the. Uh, Okay. Headphones to it Richard. Should, it, so should be, it should be able to just be able to hear it. Oh, just be able to yeah. hear it. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, we'll, we'll just ask him about about you. So just before you, you go on, I'd send Punter back, and like people think he's tough, but I spend a lot of time with him. Um, he's actually quite mentally fragile. Um, <laughs> oh, if that gets back to him, that's gonna. <laughs> no one watches this. Do, do you want a headline for the? For, Ricky Ponting mentally fragile. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, Rick. I mean, I just can I start again? I'll take it. It's <laughs> 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 <That's, laughs> on him. Well, yeah. He was given a he was given a hypothetical uh, about you know who he'd want to bat with, and then he he withdrew it all. I think he was just talking about people that he respects. But uh, yeah. yeah, how I mean, how would you deal with a co- you know that's a coaching uh, issue now for you? So well, he was going to get retained. Yeah, no, that's what I was going to say. He was going to be a retention. He's not anymore. He can, he can let someone else, another mentally fragile coach, look after him <laughs> somewhere else to get through the through the IPL. No, look, he, he's he's uh, yeah. no, I love him. He's a, you know he's a different sort of cat, and everyone will probably say that about him. But when you when you get to know him and, and work out how driven he is to be the best player that he can be, and um, that's the great thing about working in the IPL. You're working with all the best players in the world, and you're trying to find ways to make them a little bit better and challenge them and. And that's what what I've had to do with him. You know, it's it's I've, every moment that I've had with him, I've just tried to make him one little bit better. So that's to so he can win games for Delhi. But actually, when he goes back to domestic cricket here, or when he's playing for Australia, that some of the things that we work on will hopefully make him a better player. And um, if he could just toughen up a little bit mentally, I think he'll be a real. <laughs> <laughs> he's got some talent. <laughs> um, we've seen some of the all time great speeches through Delhi's. Uh social media channels for so you giving speeches before the games, after the games, you know, just makes me want to run through walls for you. I mean, I do anything for you anyway. I love you. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> Stoin obviously doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, in, I'm now playing for Delhi. Yeah, Good. Yeah, I've been retained. Wheel. Um, you know, have you always been a nervous public speaker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Well, I certainly was. I, I, I don't know if you've ever seen some of the first ever interviews I did down in Tassie as a, they're good. Oh my God. I've you never know, seen him. Haven't, haven't you? No, no, no. You should have a look at some of those. I couldn't couldn't put two words together, and probably haven't, not much better now. But, um, but some of the speeches during the IPL, I, I mean, they're awesome. Unbelievable. They're unbelievable. Yeah, oh, and I'm not that comfortable with those things being recorded. And oh, right, out. yeah. Like okay. they, every time, every time it's done, I, I do the speech. They record it. They make they send it to me straight away. I've got to look at it and approve it before it goes out. Oh, right, I'm pretty, yeah, protect, okay. I'm pretty protective of a lot of the stuff. So a lot of the stuff that I do say, you yeah, know, it's not, you don't see anyway because if it's. Okay. Tactical stuff or stuff that I've talked about the opposition or whatever yeah. that's always that's taken out and, yeah. yeah and so you only see the the good bits I guess but well not so much the good bits the bits that I'm happy to, to for everyone to see but mm. um and well, one thing I hope you you sort of do pick up through those chats most of the time it's it's all really positive stuff regardless if we won or lost and a lot of the time I'm just trying to pump the boys' tires yeah. up and and make them better that way so yeah. I mean, the players rave about you, you know, whenever we talk to them on air, off air, they love it. Like I, I look at you and I just, I just think about how much demand you must be in, uh, just as a, like as a, as a business property, uh, you know, you, you have 
business interests. You're kind to people. You obviously are a legend of the game. You co- you have coaching success, and you know your name has been mentioned in dispatches about uh, the, an Australian coaching role one day. And I, I mean, I just wonder whether Australia, the Australian men's team, could afford you not just for money, but for time, you know, because it's 300 days on the road. I know there's talk about splitting white ball, red ball. JL's got the gig at the moment, of course, but, you know, you know a lot of people feel very would feel very safe with you at the helm of the Australian men's team. But is it, is it something that, given all the other interests you have in life, that you would ever consider? Time's the only thing that stops it, to mm. be honest, and you, you're, mm. you're absolutely spot on there. Like I'd, I'd love to coach the Australian cricket team, but I'd, for what I've done with my playing career and being on the road as much as I have and being as, away as much as I have, and I've got a... You know, youngish family now. You know, a seven-year-old boy and a, mm. you know, and one end and a thirteen-year-old girl at the other. To give up three hundred days a year mm. for me right now is just not what I feel I could do. Um, that's where the IPL works so well for me. You know, to be able to do eight, nine, ten weeks in the winter months um, overseas, and then to be able to come back and do the Channel Seven stuff in the summer. You know, I've got I've got enough work there to keep me happy and keep me around the game, but also enough time to be able to spend with the family. So. Um, yeah, let's wait and see what they what they do with if they do split the teams and whatever uh, the yeah the, the coaches up amongst the white ball and red ball teams and and see what you know what what might eventuate there. But it's yeah, I think everyone would love to be coach of the Australian cricket team. But it's I, I actually think now it's a, it's a sort of a or well, the way I look at it anyway with my personal life, it's almost an, an older man's job or a, someone that's really yeah. young and not mm-hmm. married and got not got family or someone that's on the other end of it where Justin is now where he's got, mm. you know, his family are sort of all grown up and mostly moved away and, and you know, you're, you're not giving up as much of that side of your life as you normally would. Um, I mean, it's yes, it's over 300 days a year, pretty high-pressure job as well. You know, he's, he's Justin's been under pressure for... Since he took over that, really? Yeah, I've noticed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've read some stuff online that, about yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, and even more so. More, yeah, more so the last few months. But yeah. you know, it's that's that's the only thing that would stop me is is the time commitment with it. Uh, Rahul Dravid has taken over from Ravi mm. Shastri in India. Um, mm. pe- people mentioned you in dispatches for that gig. Uh, not just YouTube commenters on us, though. There was plenty of them as well. <laughs> did you? Did you? Would, what would, would, would that? Did you look at that job? Did that does that job appeal? Would that job appeal to you? How would you have felt about it? It's exactly the same. I mean, it's mm. exactly the same amount of time. But I'm living in India for for <laughs> 300 days of the mm. year. Which, yeah, look, I had a couple of conversations with some people during the IPL about about it. Um, you know, and they were the people that I spoke to were pretty hell bent on trying to find a way to make it work. Because the first thing I said was, I I just can't. You know, I can't give up that time. I've got other – that means I can't coach in the IPL. Mm. I'd have to give up seven stuff in the summer. Like, it just it just can't work. Mm. But, you know, it's it's nice to have people to think think that you might be able to do these big jobs, but there's a lot more to, to, to come with it than just saying yes or no to a coaching gig. Mm. If Ricky Ponting coaches India, oh, that's oh, – that's, that's, so I'm sad. sorry, that's, that's me. Know? I mean, I love you. I'd do anything for you. I've already <laughs> said that, but – you got that like would a, be the you end. You got the Baiju sort of yeah. thing on blue. <laughs> yeah. Big know. Oakley's on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that, I think you'd be fine, but yeah, yeah. Well, I'm actually I'm surprised that Driver's done it as well because there was a lot of a lot of chat about how happy he was in yeah. his in his yeah. under nineteen role, I think, mm. or his academy role that he had. And mm. um, I'm not sure much about his family life or what he's got, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he's got youngish kids, mm. at least one anyway. And so I'm surprised that he took it, but um, I, yeah, I think as I said, the people that I spoke to are pretty. They were going to make sure they got. Exactly the right person, so they've been able to convince yeah. driver to, to do it. With the guys you coach now, a lot of them would have watched you play, so you would have been like their idol. To, I'm sure to a lot of the guys, right? So you're you're I'm would trying to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Not too many Indians were well, looking um, up to us. Well, <laughs> I'm saying like Stoinis, perhaps you know, for instance, mm. or you know, even Steve Smith or whatever. But like, um, so you automatically have this sort of um, you know this credibility in the bank. Whereas like when you were captain of like the like the team when you had the best team. Like, did you have the same weight of, you know, people's attention in the dressing room when you're giving a pre-game talk, like, or is McGrath throwing grapes at Warren? Probably a bit of both. <laughs> I was probably making a speech and McGrath was throwing grapes at Warren yeah. at the same time. My like, Ponting stands up and goes, come on, boys, we're going to yeah. get into him here and blah, blah. Is everyone, like, eyes on Ricky Ponting? Yeah, look, I probably talk a lot more now than I did back then. Okay. Um, a lot of my, t- certainly a lot of the captaincy stuff, um, when I was captain of the Australian team, it wasn't rah-rah stand-up speeches. It was yeah. about spending individual time with individuals and and getting to know them that way it's sort of almost like a you know i had to the biggest part of captaincy for me was understanding people's personalities because i i couldn't stand mm. up in a in a as captain of a team and make a speech and expect that everyone's going to s- take on right what i said exactly the same way so right. it was about 
you know, if I had Andrew Simons over there and Justin Langer over there and I'm saying the same speech, both of those guys are going to interpret what I say in completely different ways. Mm, so mm. it was about spending one-on-one -on -one time and breaking down characters and understanding people as well as I could. And then hopefully that, uh, hopefully the respect and time that I'd shown them as individuals, um, they would then show back to me as captain. And if we did that, then I knew that we'd get some good results on the field. Mm, mm. Uh, we, we joke a lot, Ricky, about how there's like a, you know, like grade cricket or Australian cricket is like a feudal system, like a pyramid, you know, like you just, you're respected according to how many runs you've scored or how many games you've played at the top. Doesn't matter whatever else you are in life, whether you're a good person or whatever, respect is just literally afforded like a pyramid, you know, even like, uh, I mean, I'm sort of joking, but... Even when Haydos was defending JL the other day, he was he was like, "How could we speak like this about a man who's played a hundred tests?" I'm like, "Well, how many tests do you need to play to get respect?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like it's, it's sort of an invisible economy, yeah, yeah. and yet, uh, you know, you've played the most tests, and um, you you seem to be able to treat people very equally. You know, we've I, I play cricket, great cricket with guys who've played with you and just they just can't believe how welcoming and accommodating you were, and you would have then played test cricket with guys who were very much about like I'm up here you're down there we're not gonna name any names but like so where does that come from with you you know like is that a, is that the influence of your parents is that a decision that you just made um because I think the way you treat people which is completely different to the cricket economy we grew up with is rare you know is, is that something you've observed or um where, where does it come from it's a good question. I don't know where it comes from. I think I think it's it's got to have something to do with your upbringing and your background and your, my family life and probably my early club cricket days. To be honest, I mean I was a young kid in a in a pretty successful Northern Tasmanian senior men's cricket team that had a lot of state players around it. And I, it back then I knew that every one of those senior guys that were looking at me as a ten year old would all that they were thinking about was what was going to be best for me. How could they help me? How could they make me better? You know and that was the sort of environment that I was around. That's interesting. And then for me, it was the same thing. So if any team that I played in, I wanted to make every individual better and make the team better. So the only way I thought I could do that is by treating everyone the same and bringing yeah. everyone t together on the same journey. That, so mm -hmm. I, just wanted, I just wanted the best for everybody that I played with. And I think, you know, hopefully people – and I know I said this when I retired. When, when I spoke, spoke to the boys in Perth when I retired, I, I said to them then that I, I hope every single one of you guys that I've played in this room now, that I've played with, understand that I, that I just had your back the whole time. I just wanted mm. the best for you as individuals. And because I knew that if I looked after them, then the team would always be okay. Mm. So um, I think it probably does go back to un – I just, I just knew that I had a lot of people that were going to do whatever they could to give me the best chance in life or in, in – cricket and then I've just tried to make sure I've done that the same with, with everyone that I've played with whether that's Harbage and Singh that I captained at Mumbai when I went there once <laughs> mm. we got in the same team it was whatever we'd done was done and, and we're going to go on this together and try good and bloke when you get to know him kind of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he actually wasn't he actually was a good bloke yeah. <laughs> that's funny how that works I just on that Rick um and you've just touched on this. You've obviously had the, the, the first experience you had at Mowbray. It's like imprinting theory. It, yeah. it was of older men who actually took you under their wing and encouraged you. That's not what I think most people get when they play grade cricket. I don't but like, understand uh, that, no. no, I don't understand no. it at all. Like guys just with court jester hats on, they were naked, <laughs> um, you know. But talk it. you're actually spot on. It doesn't happen in every team. It no, didn't happen no. in every team that I played in. Yeah. yeah. You know, if as a 17-year-old in a Tassie team or a – 20 year old on your first tour for Australia to the West mm. Indies. It, um, it didn't always happen that way, mm. but that was, it had happened to me at a young age. Yeah. I'm, I wanted that some of the best things that ever happened in my cricketing life was like, I'd be a 13 year old boy playing for Mowbray, having one of the state's fastest bowlers bowling at me and sledging me. And I've got my teammate at the other end that wouldn't stand for that at all. You, yeah. you don't talk to him like Mate, that. How mm. good were you? Thirteen. Which bowler is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's the other thing. My uncle that. Greg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he'd, he'd, actually, he'd actually moved to he he moved to Hobart. <laughs> um, just hooked him. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But th those things they stand out to me because I knew. Yeah, people were just they were just going to stand up for me and look out for me and yeah. do the best that they could. And mm. then that's just part of the, so that's just become part of who I am. That's amazing. That's all. Well, yeah. I mean, Mowbray has so much to, uh, you know, yeah. we've got so much to thank Mowbray for. Yeah, the the well, nation does. Clearly. I, I wondered, um, I just wondered if you also, on the other hand, just alpha, because um, <laughs> there's a former teammate of yours, again, anonymous, played a lot of state cricket with you, Tassie, and, um, and you were respected never reveal sources. But he tells a story about, <laughs> like, there'd be blokes in the Tassie side 
who'd make 30 or 40 or something like that. And they'd carry, you know, we've all seen them before. They carry themselves with confidence in the sheds afterwards because, you know, they've made a couple of runs or whatever. And then the 18 year old Ricky Ponting would just say, I'll get a few today, did you? (laughs) Is that a Tassie thing? Because it was almost exactly what Tim Payne said to Will Pekofsky after making a double ton (laughs) last year. And uh, yeah, yeah, I I just, I just wanted to know if that rings true to your experience, you know, would you just, You'd, you'd I'm trying to put the pieces together to work mm. out who this anonymous. <laughs> it was it was said very endearingly, but it was yeah. it was all, it was someone it was a senior player to you yeah. in, in terms of age, just sort of going like he he could be 18 and just and just say to someone, "I'll oh, get a few," and just cut them down just in <laughs> one go, score 30 odds, oh, get a few. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I'm not could sure. we role play it? Maybe like I'm not sure I'll, I was ever I'm trying to cut anyone down like that. It was probably just having a you know. You, you, you're right. You knew you knew when guys are pretty happy with themselves, and I think. One thing I also had at Mowbray was they, those guys that were looking out for me, they were also making sure that I wasn't getting too far ahead of myself. Yeah, you know, yeah, if yeah, I was yeah. ever taking a step, then they'd they'd give me a little pat in the head or drag me back down pretty quickly. And little things like that that I might say around that Tassie dressing room would have yeah. been that. You know. Oh, yeah. so you're happy with, happy with 40, are you? Well, you probably shouldn't be happy with 40. Because <laughs> 30 or 40 is not going to win us too many games. So it might be, you know. Well, did, like, how, how did it sound to actually say, like, get a few today, did you? Like, yeah. did you just say that? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say it again? I'll oh, get a few today, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I just really want to clip that up. <laughs> yeah, clip it you up. Should, you should never no, ask for an so impression, you know, but... Uh, oh, God. So much of this is so foreign to me. Like, mm. apparently 40 is not a good score. That's also news to me. Yeah, um, that's right. I understand that. I remember there was a there was a, a line in your, one of your early books where, I think, was it your dad who said, like, you shouldn't be happy uh, averaging 40 in Shield Cricket. What are you even here for? You know? Dad used to have a lot of little. Well, that's where I've got that. I oh, get a few today. That, that's, <laughs> it would have come. You said it with the right. It yeah. would have come from. It would have come <laughs> from him <laughs> because he was always, and you know, Dad was never hard on me. Yeah, but I remember some of the early, you know, junior days or whatever. You know, I'd come home and oh, how many did you get today, mate? Oh, 180, Dad. Be like, why didn't you get 200? Oh, you know, be something like that. Or I remember the, one of the first ever <laughs> games of junior footy I played under 13s footy. First, like for the NTJFA, like so for North Launceston, I'd only ever played school footy before that. Whatever, I kicked five goals. I, first under game under thirteen, kicked five goals. I must have had fifty odd kicks. And same thing, I came home that day and said, "Dad said, oh, how'd you go?" I said, "Yeah, pretty good. Got a few kicks and kicked five goals." And it was like, "Why don't you kick six goals?" I, like, <laughs> okay, I just can't do anything. I just can't do anything right. But that's um, yeah, so that's probably where it. But did it? Did you? Uh, did you feel like he what he you know he was proud of you you know ultimately with all the runs that you scored? I think so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think he might have ended up being pretty proud. I mean, it, yeah. It, the story I tell about him is well, that, that I rang him from Perth the day before my last test, and I said, "Dad, time's up. Um, I'm I'm retiring tomorrow, or at the end of the game." He said, "What are you talking about, you bloody idiot? Just get, go and get some runs in this game, and everything will be fine." And played two hundred tests. <laughs> yeah. I'm done. Yeah. I made this decision, no, he, but he couldn't. Yeah. He couldn't accept it. He wanted mm. his son to keep playing for yeah. Australia as long That's as he could. Cool. Yeah. Sachin played two hundred tests. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he, was, yeah. Yeah. he left a few in the bank. Actually, yeah. 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 Mate, I actually saw. Look, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm taking over a bit here, but I, I, b- before you retired, um, or you had that, you had the the final series against South Africa, and you, you hung him up. I actually, I was working at uh, Telstra in Melbourne. With there's a big big tower there you can see the mcg from it we're up high and i was, victoria was playing tasmania in a shield game and i just skived off work at about three uh, i don't know what time it was two o'clock or something and i went down and i watched you score one of the great hundreds against pattinson and siddle and these guys and alex dolan was at the other end and i think he you know he was he'd batted three for australia or or whatever and i mean just about to think i think he got 102 didn't he or 90 yeah or yeah and he mm. and and you know, with respect to Alex, it, there were two different players, you know, at either end. And I, you just looked in such great touch against two test bowlers. And then, you know, the 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 common story is like, oh, well, you know, yeah, Stain and, and Morkel had their way with Ricky Ponting and it was time to go. I mean, I was I just saw that innings in Perth, just sat there by myself like a really cool guy. Uh, and I was like, mate, Ponting, is, Ponting can still play big time. It was pretty um, flat that day, though, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, was, you know. it must have been. Yeah. <laughs> if I got runs that side, yeah. it must have been flat. No, look, that, that was the, the end of the day. I was batting as well as ever yeah. that, that last summer. Like I, I was a leading run scorer in Shield cricket for the year. And yeah. uh. I'd had about, I had three bad games for the year. There were three test matches, and what yeah. that what that said to me was that I mean, at the end of the day, I, 
My batting, I was batting no differently. I was just trying so bloody hard. No. I couldn't, I couldn't let it go. I knew, I knew the end was closer than the the, the start. I wanted to make sure I was doing everything, um, as well as I possibly could for the younger blokes in the Aussie team as well. I mean, re- really, see, I think I've said this to you guys before. I, I should have retired probably two years before I did. Mm. That was, I mean, I, I was on a decline for two years before I actually re- retired, but. Mm. I wanted to be around that Aussie team for Warner and Smith and Johnson and Haddon and that younger group that were coming in. I wanted to be around that team to help those guys through the initial parts of their career. So I sort of dragged myself through it a little bit Mm. for what I thought was going to be the right thing for the Australian cricket team. Um, I try. I'd, I'd never trained so hard, really. Like for every preseason I had, I'd work my back. So I was fitter than I'd ever been before, and all those little things were just. It was just, as I said, I couldn't. I just couldn't let go. I just. Try way too hard, put too much pressure on myself to do everything perfectly. And I got to the stage where I'd go out in a shield game, not even think about getting out. It was only about going out and getting runs. But I'd go out in a test match, and the first thing I was worried about was not getting out. Mm. So therefore, I was thinking about not getting out rather than scoring runs, and that's a bad place to be. You know, that's what yeah. I any any of these young or well not young guys, even this even David Warner. I've spoken to Davey the last few weeks since the end of the IPL, and he didn't get off to the greatest start in this World Cup. But I said, mate. I guarantee you one thing: you're thinking about not getting out when you're going at the bat. Don't think about not getting out. Think about hitting the first ball for six or hitting the first ball for four. And when you think about the game that way, it becomes a lot easier. When you're worried, when you're worried about failing, it becomes really difficult. And that's where it was. That's where I was mm. the last couple of years that I played. And I was able to do it at shield, shield level because it wasn't that big a deal if I if I missed out there. But when I got to the Australian team, I wanted, I wanted to show all of those young blokes what, how hard you had to work and what you had to do and how disciplined you had to be. And that was. For me, that just was the wrong way to go about it. Mm. Has Warner got? I mean, I'm going to ask you: Has Warner got more runs in him? I know you're going to say yes, but like, what happened with in the IPL with um, Sunrisers? Thank you, Sunrisers. Yeah, with, was really bizarre because he's had such a great six years in a row, over 600 runs or whatever. Yep. Like, um, but I suppose there's been a little bit of a downward trajectory with him the last couple of years. But you back him for more runs this summer in, a, in yeah, Australia? I don't think it was lack of runs that kept him out of that okay. Sunrisers team. I think he must have upset someone there somewhere. Okay, I, and. It had to be the owners. He made some comments at the start of the tournament about how they got all the selections wrong for one game. I think it was against Rajasthan. Mm-hmm. Davey, got, Davey got 50 odd in that game. Yeah, and then he right. made some comments after it. And I think he, got, he might have got dropped for the next game and didn't play again. So yeah. even if, even the last game of the season this year, Kane Williamson didn't play. He missed out. And they still didn't bring Davey back for the last game, yeah. having been there for six. So he's obviously upset someone. And I haven't spoken about, about it, but... Um, if he's in the, I've, I've said this to him as well. He's going to be in the big auction next year. There'll be a, there'll be a lot of teams that'll be looking for David so. Warner, yeah. and they'll spend a lot of money on him because he's his IPL record is brilliant. I think he's the third or fourth highest yeah. run scorer, mm. isn't he? In the yeah. One of the greats, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Was it? Uh, was that also part of the thing? Obviously, it was so hard for you guys to get basically charged out of the the IPL this year. Then you got you got done by uh, CSK in that first game mm. by a guy who's now legally blind, um, MS Doney. <laughs> 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 you know, like how does he keep doing that? I mean, how old's Doney? Is he forty? Up there, he's up there, yeah. Yeah, and he he came in at the end and he scored what twenty off not many balls. It was his only knock all year. <laughs> only knock all year. Yeah, yeah. thanks for reminding me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, you you guys were the were the best team the best all team, tournament. Yeah. Uh, and then KK got him at Sharjah and yeah, we did that. The draw didn't work out that well for us. I mean, we had our chance against CSK. We should we should have won that game. We went gone straight into the final, but it was a really disappointing way for us to end. The last three games we played, the last round game against RCB, they needed nine off two balls. Mm. They got two off the second last ball. They did seven to win off the last ball of the game. Arvish Khan bowls a leg side wide, mm. six to win. Knee high full toss last ball over long See line six. We had, that's how we lost that one. Mm. Then we lost the next one against Chennai. I think they needed twenty odd off the last two overs. Yeah. Um, we had Tom Curran or Rabada left to bowl mm. the last over. Mm. We chose to bowl Tom Curran the last over. We did. Yep. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> we did. I saw the post game <laughs> speech there. Yeah. 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 We did. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the Calcutta game. I mean, that I'm not sure if you guys watched that, but we, we didn't – Sharjah was never going to be a good place to play there no, with the three we, yeah, spinners we that did they watch had. The game, and they yeah. played a lot of their cricket there. Um, but even with that game, I think they needed 12 off 25 balls, I think. And yeah. not, then they needed six off two. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they hit the second last ball for six. So, yeah, yeah it was a – we, we we were. I said this to the boys at the end. I, I still think we were the best team in the tournament. Um, you know, as good as Chennai were, and they went on obviously to win it again. I, I think we were the best team. We mm. just that, like we just had a couple of critical mistakes and critical moments that mm. we 
we made at the end, which is the difference in winning and losing T20 games mm. and the difference in winning or losing tournaments. Yeah, yeah. That. And we, I, yeah, we made those mistakes. I think uh, part of my excitement, not just because my team Australia is playing against, I get to mm. watch them, but like just cricket outside of the UAE for the first time in like what feels like six months is exciting because yeah. UAE looks like a grim place. To, to go and play cricket. I mean, I'm not sure what I expect you to say to that. Other than I actually watched a clip of you facing uh, Muhammad Sami, uh, batting in a baggy green. He bumped you. That was in Sharjah. Yeah, and he hit you in the chin. chin. The yeah. Chin. Yep. That that's that day, it was 55 degrees. That's right, yeah. Air temperature. Was that the game where Australia, they bowled Pakistan for like 50 and 53? Yeah, we, we batted first. So we got, I think we got close to 400. Matty, Matty Hayden batted for the whole day. Got a 100 and I, I got out before lunch and basically got carried off the field. I got a cramp in – I got halfway off, got a cramp in my calf, mm. took another step, got a cramp in my other calf, oh. got a cramp in my hammy, got a cramp in my other oh. hammy. I literally got carried off the ground and I batted for about an hour and a half. It was unbelievably hot. Yeah. I mean, we – I got hit, as you said, with a baggy green on because it, it was actually too hot to wear a helmet. You couldn't Ooh, wear a helmet. Really? So we, everyone was batting in caps because it was just so hot. Yeah. The, there's, there's footage of the guys at the non-strikers end that were – Curled up, hiding in the shadow that was created by the umpire. The boys, the boys are hiding. Oh, Slipstream. Okay, it was unbelievable. Fifty-five. Yeah. So they're bringing out tables and chairs and stuff for the drinks breaks, and so yeah, it, that's it was right. Yeah, no crazy. Good. But yeah. Hados, I don't know he did it, but he batted all day. Yeah. Uh, we were just talking about the IPL before. You know, Australians, I think, have a uh, like a, a hazy relationship to the IPL. We're all told, and we know that it's the best competition and it pays the most money but at the same time and we joke about it it's on at the wrong times for Australian and for Australians and the jerseys look weird and the sponsors we don't they're foreign to us and so we just you know we don't we, we don't the, the lights are dim yeah. you know so we don't acknowledge it but um, then when anyone anybody does watch it you realize it's really the, the big deal good. and like who uh, you know and we know that there are Indian players coming through but we don't know any of their names and stuff like like who, who are the who are the young Indians of the next generation coming through? That you just think, oh, they, these guys are unbelievable. Um, they and they and they really impress you. Well, we've got one. We've got Prithvi Shaw, who we saw oh, a little no. bit he in Australia good. last summer. He looks he, amazing. Technically, in Australia last summer, he wasn't ready for. Mm. You got him out cricket. actually just before the first ball. Yeah, that, and, and, that, and that's that's how that works, right? So I've never <laughs> spoken to anyone in the Australian cricket team about how they should bowl to guys that I coach. In Why? Here. Yeah. <laughs> but when I got on You're air, a spy. and when I got on air, and I said, "Oh, just before the first ball, actually, <laughs> oh, he, he, yeah, just yeah. shape one back in." Get, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but Every, yeah. yeah. So every, I get yeah. all these calls from, "Oh, you're telling all these sort of secrets <laughs> on our boys," and like, no, I haven't said a yeah. word. Like yeah. I just, I just yeah. said it on TV, and, yeah. it, and it and it happened the way. Wait, start swinging it into a right hand. Start swinging it at one fifty. It's going to do some damage. Yeah. But he, Prithvi Prithvi Shaw looks he amazing. is yeah. an exceptional talent. He looks good, I mean, yeah. he the start of his the start of his IPL, the first part of the tournament in India this year, mm. was as good as I've ever seen anyone yeah. bat. We were losing it over just through the back. offside, just mm. yeah, yeah, front yeah. and back foot. Yeah. The way he picks the bat up, he, he plays mm. the short ball probably yeah. better than most Indians as mm. well because he's prepared nice and early, and he's got a you know, high back lift and good wrist cock and whatever else. Mm. Um, yeah, I still remember that game in Chennai. We're playing a really slow, low turning wicket in Chennai against Calcutta. Mm-hmm. And when we got there, I'd sort of said to the boys, I've mapped out a pretty clear game plan of what I wanted to get in the power play, and you know, let's make yep. sure we're, let's make sure we're none or one down for forty, and then we'll mm. get we'll get sixty through the next eight overs, and uh -huh. then we, you know, we'll get to one hundred and forty, and that's going to be enough. Yeah, he hit six he hit six fours off the first over, pretty <laughs> <laughs> well, against one of his under nineteen teammates. He just absolutely yeah. destroyed him. I think we uh -huh. were. I think there's a wide in there as well. We we're none for 25 off the first over, so I'm sending messages out. Don't worry about being none for 40. <laughs> <laughs> keep going now. Like, yeah, keep yeah. going. Um, I'm not sure if you saw the young kid, Gay Quad, from Channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 we, we talked to Watto. Watto was on mm. our show oh, weekly. Yeah. Well, he um, would have pumped up the Channel boys, Watto. Oh, he loved it. Yeah, 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 no, big yeah. Channel guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, um, MS he, Tony, good apparently. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah he talked about Guy Quad as well. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. he looked amazing. He looks the business, yeah. yeah. Let him run score. Venkatesh, oh yeah. Mm. yeah. Open for Calcutta the back half of the season. He's a real talent. Came from nowhere as well. He didn't play the first half. Yeah. And, and Cal Shirt out, no lid. Yeah, that's him, yeah. And ended up, being, ended up bowling some overs as well. And yeah. He's an all-rounder. Um, I, I spoke to Brendan McCullum about him actually in the first part of the tournament. I saw him batting in the nets um, with us one day. And I, and I said to I said to Brendan, who's this kid? He's not, <laughs> yeah, he's not playing. He said, no, nah, I can't get him in at the moment and whatever else. And. And they re after that break, they came back with an almost completely different theory on how they wanted to play, and it was a bit more Brendan's way with you know, going really hard at the top. So they got this kid in at the top, and he was very good. Uh, obviously, there's Paddicool in at RCBs, a really good mm -hmm. um, young opening batter as well. <laughs> Rajasthan have got a kid called um, 
Jay Swal, who's an uh, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. let, let mm-hmm. opener as well. Um, you mentioned all these younger guys, Ricky, and like uh, like the the current Indian side. They're they're full of superstars and legends and stuff. We that they were they didn't get past the group stage of the T Twenty World Cup. Okay, you make a couple of mistakes and you're gone. It's pretty unforgiving. But uh, we watched a lot of these guys you're talking about, and that you know they play bright, attacking, aggressive cricket. I mean, do you think the the Indian side needs to look at regenerating to get some of these guys in because because it always feels like India's coming up so strong. We talk about the Asian century that the younger guys could be better than the current guys. Yeah, I think. In, they were just exhausted. Yeah, I mean mm. they their run, what they've had. Yeah, and you've got to understand where they've been. I mean, their whole country's been in lockdown, right? So any mm. cricket they've and then they've last year's IPL in, in the UAE, they went straight back home. They played their domestic cricket at home. With, you know, they then went to England. In between this, they come from England straight into another bubble in the UAE. Play there, they go straight into the World Cup. Mm. They've got New Zealand, I reckon, <coughs> about two days it's after. Two days after, yeah, two days mm. after the World Cup. Yeah. They, I mean, yeah, but they. I mean, they had Ishan Kishan in that squad, didn't they? They yep. had Surya Kumar in that squad. Yep. They're starting to bring a few younger guys in. Suresh so Ayer was around. He was one of the emergencies around the squad. But I can't. You're not going to push Rohit Sharma out. You're not going to no. push Virat out. You're not going to push KL Rahul out. Um, you know, they had Hardik Pandya in there. That's mm. maybe a little bit. If he's not bowling, and maybe they could use another batter in that middle order. Maybe another one of those younger blokes. But yeah, they've. There's just so many of them. There's so many good yeah. young players that when when a one. One of their senior guys doesn't go so well. You think, oh, well, you know, are they better putting these young blokes in? But mm. yeah, they're, they're yeah, they're, they've got too many. And that's mm. what makes it. That's why we're that's why we these questions come up. If mm. it, you know, they've got so many really good young players. Yeah, well, we've got Travis Head and Kawaja, so well, you know, it bounces yeah. it up. <laughs> they're good players as well. Good <laughs> players as well. They're, they're, they're good players. Um, Australia going to Pakistan. Well, hopefully. First time in 24 years you were there the last time. When is that scheduled for? I was March. Of- first week of March. You got something on? You got to move some stuff around? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I don't think I'll be going on that tour. Okay. No. But obviously I want to ask you about the last time we were there, one of the most famous one for uh, 13 or five overs, uh, your, your, your one for getting Moen Khan out. Uh, but also in that game, reverse ma- swing, reverse swing out, re- reverse, yeah. yeah. I don't know how a guy got reverse zero on that on that uh, on that deck because Australia got five hundred, six hundred, then Pakistan got six hundred. It's a game that mm. Mark Taylor got three thirty four, not out, and you were batting with him mm. at the time, and you missed out that day. You only got seventy six, I think. Mm. Um, not but, out, not out. Red ink, sorry. Uh, but uh, you know, when you walked off the field, he just finished on three thirty four. He tried to get the three thirty fifth, but uh, he missed out. But did you wait for him? To say well batted, Rick, or did you say it first, or how did that play out on that day when you walked? All the field? I said to him that night was, "Whatever you do, you're not declaring overnight." Oh, really? Yeah. You told him not to because I was that was I was out of the side. I'd come back in for that game. Yeah. I was pretty keen to get a hundred. Oh, so I was okay, like, right. Don't worry about Bradman's record, mate. Just yeah. keep you know, just keep keep bat. We'll bat on tomorrow for the first session, and then yeah. we can declare it with lunch. <laughs> Do you uh, think times have changed? You, you, you told Mark Taylor to bat on so you could score a hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought you were going down the path of like, no, you know, Tubby, make sure you, you yeah. get past Pradman, but you just wanted to. Well, and so I didn't sure. play the next test. Oh, go. okay. Ah, the unwritten story. I looked up of that, that declaration. Was, I didn't play the next test. Okay, that was your nineteenth test. That, I don't know what I, what I want you to do with that, but mm. I thought you were more established than that. You were, but obviously no, not. I think so. I came. I think I might have come in for Buff. I think Buff might okay. have played the game before, got injured. I come in for that game. Buff was right for the next one, so I went back out again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Coming as the all-rounder. Just yeah, I don't know yeah. why I was bowling. <laughs> must have been flat. It was pretty flat. <laughs> it must have yeah. been flat. Uh, yeah. I think that's... That's bang on the hour. Uh, Ricky Ponting, what a pleasure. We've been... Um, uh, we're extremely grateful that we'd have you in the studio. Um, great to be able to talk about Ponting Wines as well. well we, I mean, didn't, we didn't get to crack yeah. one, did we? Yeah, well... And we should say, I mean, we try and be as authentic as we can on the show. But, yeah, we um, have drunk them. We, we <laughs> not, not, not these yeah. bottles here. Yeah. I mean, we've had them before. They're good. There was a talk about actually cracking them open, but it truly is 9am and we all just went, <laughs> you know, we had a blowout on Saturday yeah, yeah. and just, yes, it wasn't looking good. But, <laughs> yeah, I've got notes. I mean, the South Blanc, South Blanc I, you know, I have had it before, fresh and floral notes, obviously. Yeah, fresh and floral. You're reading the back yeah. of the bottle. No, right? not at all. Oh. Um, zesty passion fruit, great little grapefruit nose on that one. <laughs> I tell you what, I had a, I had a rose out the other day, and because uh, I had a bit of a blowout, but like a Pez just asked me like why did, why did that happen? I just started talking about the weather. Yeah, I was just saying like how and like I started with a rose out that day, and it was just the perfect accompaniment to like mm. a nice summer sitting on the balcony. Well, this is the Rihanna rose. Uh, oh right, goes, okay, yeah. 
Which yeah, is, she's gen- pretty happy. She's got a name on on the yeah. front of one of the bottles. Yeah. It's gently perfumed, crisp finish. So yeah, yeah. It's been good fun though. I must admit, this whole business venture for Rana and I to be involved in our own business together has been great, especially through COVID times where it hasn't been you know, it hasn't been that easy to to break into big uh, retailers and and stuff. But mm. with you know some of our direct online sales have been really strong and f- and. When the kids have been in one room getting their homeschooling done, it's been good for Anna and I to have a, something that we're really passionate about to be able to work on together and on a daily basis. So it's um, yeah, that's been good. The product is is outstanding. Our our winemaker in South Australia, Ben Riggs, has done an amazing job. Um, we try to tell name. a story through the range as well. So it's mm. you notice in the there's two Tasmanian wines in the range of Pinot and a Chardonnay, both from northern suburbs of Tassie. So yeah, that's what we're trying. Like the one the one the only issue we've had sort of with the wine so far is that a lot of people think it's just a you know a celebrity brand and he's thrown his name on the front of a bottle and then you know run away from it and hope to make some money out of it it's not that for us at all it's it's the exact opposite the fact that it has got a name on it makes us work even harder because we need to be mm. fully invested and and we want the you know the brand obviously to be as successful as possible and you know, you know the other business the other guys in the business with us i've said to them i said this is the the success of this business will come down to longevity you know mm. how, lo- how long we can maintain and sustain really good high level product in the marketplace which is a pretty competitive marketplace too i must admit is is how we'll how i'll judge the business anyway so it's um yeah it's been been great so far and when, and uh onto our second and third vintages now so it's um very young business in you know we're not not, not even two years established yet but um it's been great fun yeah it's it's quite yeah. it's quite classy. I would have thought of like a you know a baggy green wearing like grizzled legend of the game to be in the wine business, you know, because you normally attach beer, you know, to cricketers. Like, yep. um, you know, how do the Mowbray guys, you know, feel about the fact that one of their own is now hawking wine? And, and is it your dream one day, you know, after the day's play that cricketers are now cracking open a you know a Rihanna rosé uh, to you know to celebrate? So I can guarantee you, in the eyes of every Mowbray cricketer that's ever played, I've done two things wrong in my career. <laughs> one was blow my wife a kiss when I got a double hundred in Adelaide <laughs> against India, and the second one was to start my own wine label. <laughs> that, that's the, the two but is I've that like wrong. not manly or yeah. something? Is that oh, what you're you love about? your wife, do you? Yeah, yeah, that's, right. like, okay, yeah. that's quite how a affection. Yeah. How, 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 how many Mowbray boys do you think have actually had a glass of Pinot at the end of a day's play? Not, not, <laughs> not, not too many. I reckon they would have, but just not told, not told yeah. you about it. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. Mm. So the, Mo- the the Pinot is called the Mowbray boys. So that once again with the once again with the story that we're trying to tell is. You talk to anyone about me in t- in Tasmania, how would they describe me? They'd say he's a he's a Mowbray boy. So mm. that's that's the name of that one. And Sauvignon Blanc is the first session, which the you know the, the Sauvignon Blanc sort of is the start of our range, if you like. The first session, the start of a test match. Mm. How important the first session? Crack might it be. open in the first tell, session. Ten a.m. I don't need yeah. to tell you boys how important the first session is, but um, <laughs> that's what we've that's what we've tried to create through this is, is storytelling as much as anything through the range and. Labeling, as you said, looks like a baggy green colours. The gold. Th- this is supposed to represent yeah. you know, creams. Yeah. 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 Safety. It, looks, it looks premium. Safety. All, Makes of me feel premium. Safe. All of that stuff, mate. Yeah. Tamar Valley, that one, isn't it? Spicy cherries and sort of a quite a structured one. <laughs> oh, that's all good. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, all good. <laughs> I knew you were reading it from uh, somewhere. No, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> you know, well, that's pontingwines.com if you want to get yourself a little... Yep. Got a slice of Last year we actually had a code. I don't know if you knew this, but the code, uh, yeah. I don't think it exists now, but it was get a few. Uh, so yeah. just after that story, so we do our own sort of storytelling as well. Did you? To us, <laughs> 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 like, like that. <laughs> you said it three times. Uh, oh, Ricky Ponting, thanks, uh, thanks so much for joining us. A uh, huge pleasure. We'll never um, not be grateful for these opportunities, and uh, to come up to TGC Towers is, is particularly special as well. All the best with Ponting Wines. Summer ahead. Hope you get some time with your family uh, and uh, and a bit of a rest as well. I might see you down the beach with my Aussie shorts on again. <laughs> Is <laughs> no every chance if I saw you on the beach and I said good day, you'd be like, Who are you? Yeah. <laughs> Is this fuck? Thanks boys, thanks for having me.